Ah, much better, much better. I'm glad I did that. Uh, so now, everybody, welcome officially, welcome uh, properly to uh, another In Conversation with Graham Codrington. Sorry about that little false start there, but this wonderful digital world we now live in, uh, we do need to, to get it right. Uh, as always, if you're joining us uh, live, please go into the chat box and just tell us, uh, give us a, a wave and a, and a hello uh, from, uh, and just tell us uh, where you are at the moment. I'm coming at you as always live from my home in Johannesburg. And for those of you who've been following along the series, uh, yes, I have been kicked out of the office that I was in. My family told me to move into a different room today. Uh, it's icy cold in Johannesburg and uh, the family wants the, the warm room that that I was in. Uh, talking about weather, let me let me bring in my guest today. My guest today is Tony Alessandro, who is a legend of the assessments industry. Uh, some of you didn't even know there was an assessments industry. It's the industry that helps people to understand other people. And Tony uh, is a long time expert in this. Tony, thank you so much for joining me. I think you're probably in a more sunny, warm climate in California this morning, aren't you? Yeah. I'm in San Diego, possibly the best year round weather in the world. Well, I think Johannesburg people might argue with you. I think we get slightly colder than you do in winter, but uh, I know San Diego and Johannesburg and one or two other places in the world argue it out for who's got the best the, the best weather. I know we enjoyed. How, how are you handling lockdown? Uh, or are you guys easing out of lockdown in California at the moment? Yeah, we're, we're easing out. We uh, Restaurants are open, but uh, we have to be six feet apart. Uh, we have to wear masks going in, but not necessarily when we sit down. Uh, the beaches are open now, parks, uh, haircuts. Uh, you know, yeah, we, we, we should be finding out today about haircuts. I think our government in South Africa is making an announcement today. This, is, this, this needs taming, I think. <laughs> yeah, so we're, we're, we're pretty well there. And this is the point of the conversation, Tony, is, is that I've been wanting to interview experts who are uh, not just engaging with the crisis of COVID. I think a lot of businesses have obviously had a crisis. They've had to deal with that crisis. But as we move out of the crisis, and there's still many months to go with living with COVID, but I, I, I'm wanting to talk to people who are beginning to think about what life after the crisis might feel like. And uh, this is where I really thought that this issue of assessments would, would, would come in. And we'll, we'll obviously explain to people what you do as we go through the conversation. But you really help organizations to assess what people do, what they can do, every all sorts of different types of assessments. And companies might have laid off staff over the last few weeks and months. Uh, they might be in a state of flux. And very soon, maybe even quite soon, they're going to be looking again at how do they build up their uh, human resource capability. Um, and that's kind of where you play, isn't it? You help companies to choose the right people and assess them them carefully. Uh, do you think that this is something companies are going to need now, uh, maybe more than they were before? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so when companies start hiring people back, let's say the people that they've, that they've uh, laid off, they have to decide, uh, do I still want all those people? This is a, an ideal opportunity to not hire back some people who may not have been top performers or uh, team players. Uh, when they hire some people back, this is again a, a nice opportunity to decide where do I place these people within the organization? Maybe they were misplaced in one department versus another that they would flourish. Uh, and of course, some of their employees, maybe even top performers, may have gone someplace else where there were other opportunities. I mean, it's been a good three months. Uh, yeah. Not a lot of people could survive in three months without any payroll. So maybe they went to another company that was, in fact, open. Yeah, not everybody's been sitting around waiting for their old job to come back, right? They've right. been looking around. And, and as you say, some of them might have even been clever enough to go out and develop a, a, a different skill or, or to, to develop themselves. And so, yeah, you, you're not looking at the same, 
uh, what's that old phrase about you can't cross a river twice, you know, because the water keeps flowing. You're not yeah. looking at the same river, are you? And and no. so now would be a good opportunity for companies to actually have a look at their at their staff. It it also uh, seems to me that if companies need to be thinking about who might be best to continue to work from home, that might be something uh, that is worth looking at. Is that something that that some of your assessments might look at? Oh, absolutely, yes. And and we'll get into that. I'll I'll talk a little bit about that. But basically, the assessments are not just for hiring. It's obviously uh, hiring, you know, selecting, developing, which is crucial, and retaining. So that's that's really what we focus on. Those three areas: how to select, develop, and retain. So. Uh, uh, so know, so I, what got you? What got you into assessments? Because and and in fact, maybe let me change my question because I'd like you to tell you tell us a little bit about your business. It, it, it's called Assessments 24-7. And in fact, I'll, I'll put the website link here uh, into the chat box for those who want to go and check it out. It's Assessments 24x7. So Assessments 24x7.com. Um, and you do like you go onto that that website and there's just all sorts of different assessments. So it's not one particular assessment that you focus on. And in fact, as far as I understand, Tony, you even help people to develop assessments if they've got frameworks and useful HR tools that can help people. So it, it really is, a, 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 I'm guessing, a toolbox that you can go into and pick out the assessments that you want. Have I understood it correctly? Yeah, uh, our company is really, uh, uh, as our logo says, a, a global leader in assessment technology. We have mm -hmm. many, many companies and individuals on our site that you won't even see on our site. You know, we, we develop or manage assessments for people like Ken Blanchard, uh, you know, who wrote the One Minute Manager, yep. Tony Robbins, Brian Tracy, many organizations that have their own unique assessments that we really don't sell, but we manage for them. And right. one of our one of our colleagues, Graham uh, Nigel, uh, out of uh, the UK, he has a zookeeper assessment. Uh, he never had it online, uh, yeah. and we're we're programming it for him. In fact, he's in his final phase of testing it, and I'm sure maybe even by the end of this week it will be operational. And he calls it the zookeeper assessment. And I'll refer to that as we go through this. So, so your your system basically uh, allows uh, anybody who's got an assessment to to build the technology behind that assessment, and then it allows users and companies to then log into those various assessments and use them in a variety of ways. Absolutely, we have a, a, a dashboard, an assessment dashboard that is, you know, uh, e-commerce enabled. It is hands off. It's all automated. Uh, it's it's a pretty significant state of the art dashboard that allows people to manage uh, the assessments, to manage the people who have taken assessments. They can run team reports, and they can run what we might call a collaboration or dual report with two people to see you know if there's any conflict resolution. Uh, a lot of people use assessments for employee development, for team building, leadership development as well as what we're chatting about, which is the, the hiring of people, making sure that we hire top performers. Now, and, and that was really why I wanted to chat to you, Tony, because I, I'm beginning to see that companies, as I said, are moving out of that crisis mentality into a more opportunity mindset. I do have two or three clients that are actually hiring left, right, and center because like companies like Zoom and others, they've just caught a wave um, uh, during this this COVID. Not, obviously, most companies are, are, are struggling at the moment, but there are a few uh, that, that saw a gap and have taken it. Why, why did you latch on to assessments? I mean, you, you've been doing this for nearly 50 years, and there's so many different ways in which you could have helped company companies deal with talent and deal with people. What is it about assessments that you think is, is so important? Well, back in the early 70s, I was going through my PhD program in business and marketing, and I came across assessments. Uh, 
And when I was writing my dissertation, I came across uh, a four style behavioral model that really intrigued me. Uh, and that's what sort of led me into that. Uh, when I wrote my first book, which was called Non-Manipulative Selling, almost sounds like it doesn't go together, does it? Non-Manipulative Selling. Uh, there was a chapter in there on the four basic behavioral types. And when I would give a speech on, on uh, non-manipulative selling, of which the behavioral types was one part of it, people would come up to me afterwards and say, hey, could you do that one little part uh, and, and speak mm -hmm. only on that part to my company, my trade association, whatever it was. And I got more and more requests for that. Uh, and, and of course, built an assessment around that, which was a, a, a separate product that can be sold. Uh, I've sold millions, millions of assessments over the years, multi-millions. Uh, so, and, and as that business grew, uh, I started sort of cutting back in my speaking. My speaking career, I, for many, many years, 30 plus years, averaged 100 plus paid speeches around the world, including South Africa, uh, where you are. And uh, uh, it just was draining, you know, doing that many speeches. So. Uh, and and what do you think the fascination is about assessments? I, I know for myself, I I do pretty much every assessment everybody offers me. Um, and, and, and I know one of the ones you, you like as well as the disc profiles and so on. And, I, you know, I've done pretty much all of them. And for me, there's as a as an introvert, as a person who likes to kind of work in my head a lot, I'm really fascinated by it. I realize these are generalizations. I realize they're just models and frameworks and that I'm an individual, but they provide huge insight into why I act and react how I in, in ways that I do and give me, I've always found them, they, they give me great um, ideas for developing myself, for realizing what my strengths and weaknesses are. And just often just put language to stuff that I, I wasn't really articulating. Um, but that's kind of what I use it for as an individual. I'm, I'm not in corporate. I don't manage a huge team. How do companies use assessments well? And 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 maybe you can help us by by telling us what we shouldn't be doing with assessments as well. How, how do you use them well so that they're not a big stick for somebody, but they really help us to develop and grow? Yeah, and, and that, that's an important consideration. We, we should only use assessments to help people grow. That's the key thing, not as uh, uh, saying, well, this is why you don't perform well or whatever. Uh, it does point out assessments do point out strengths and struggles. Uh, and what we want to do is help people with struggles that specifically impact their job. There are certain uh, struggles or weaknesses that people have that do not impact the job. So why bother with those? Just focus on the ones that will help people grow within, within the company. Now, there are two types of assessments. I'm going to simplify this. There's a yeah. self-assessment uh, where you take it, it's only you, and it tells you about yourself. The classic example would be the DISC assessment. And those of you who don't uh, know what DISC is or have heard of DISC but forgotten what it means, DISC is four different behavioral patterns, D-I-S-C, that stands for dominance, influence, steadiness, and conscientiousness. Uh, the key to understand here, at least with DISC or assessments like that, is that it is rare for somebody to be 100% of only a D, I, S, or C. Most of us, in fact, the vast majority of us, have a combination of all four. It's like a rainbow, a combination of all four. Uh, you say you're an introvert, so maybe you're more of a, uh, leaning more toward a C or an S. Uh, me, I'm, I'm a D. Uh, you know, I'm a firstborn Italian. I don't know if it's nature or nurture, uh, but a firstborn <laughs> Italian in New York City, you know, come on. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm more of a high D, uh, dominant pattern. Uh, but, you know, over the years we learn, at least I have as a D, that one of my weaknesses is impatience, Another weakness is I'm not a naturally good listener. And those are things I need to work on. I, I still have issues with impatience, uh, but listening, I've become a lot better. So let's look at the two assessments, self-assessments 
And then there are 360 degree assessments. Now, a classic example would be a leadership 360. Now, Graham, there's where you might take the assessment or somebody within a company uh, takes the assessment, they answer all these questions, and then they send out a link to other people. Typically, when we talk about 360, it would be your direct manager or managers, your peers who are at the exact same level as you that you work with day in and day out, and your direct reports. So above you, same level as you, below you. And they answer the exact same questions that you answered, and they determine how they perceive your behavior. Because a lot of times, the way I see my behavior, those are my intentions. But actions don't always match intentions. And people see the actions. They do not see the attention, the intentions. And that's why, you, you know, when you get into these disagreements with people or misunderstanding with people, you say, no, that's, that's not what I meant. Yeah. But yeah. that's what they heard. That's what they perceived. And I think part of that comes to what I call diversity intelligence, which is realizing that I might have done something with a particular purpose in mind, but because you have a different profile to me, you experience it and perceive it differently. So I mustn't only understand my own personal profile, I must understand how my profile is perceived and engaged with by other people. And that, so that's why the, it's both self and 360 are, are important, right? Yeah, one, uh, my, probably one of my, my uh, most important books and concepts was called The Platinum Rule. Now, mm -hmm. a lot of people understand the golden rule, which is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. In other words, the golden rule says I should treat you the way I would like to be treated. But remember, yeah. I'm a New Yorker. If I'm dealing with people from other countries or even other other regions within the United States, uh, it doesn't work. So the platinum rule is do unto others as they would have you do unto them. In other words, treat people the way they want and need to be treated. And in a world of increasing diversity, as you mentioned, Graham, in a world of increasing diversity, it is so important to understand that people are different and we need to interact with them at their level. You know, there's an old saying, when in Rome, do as the Romans. So that's what the Platinum Rule is about. Love it. Now, Sajid has actually uh, sent me a, a private question that I don't think can be seen on the chat. So let me uh, just talk about it. And by the way, for those of you who have joined us live, the benefit of being live is that you can ask us questions and and, and Tony will, will take those. Uh, but Sajid has asked, asked a question which makes sense to me. It was probably going to be my next question anyway. There are so many different assessments. So when we're talking about DISC, we could talk about MBTI, we could talk about Balbin, we could talk about Enneagram. Is it worthwhile doing multiple tests? Why do we have so many different tests? Um, and uh, it, it might not be a fair question to you, but do you think one is better than the others, or or how do we how should we be thinking about that? Well, don't ask me the question if I think one is better than the other others, because we have DISC, uh, but uh, DISC is probably arguably the most widely used assessment in the world. Uh, so yeah, there are a lot of different models, and, and part of it is you know you know what companies or people were exposed to and decided to go down that road. I think it's important that if you are evaluating different models like DISC or MBTI or Enneagram is to also look at their its validity. Uh, yeah. How valid is the assessment? And if you look at our validity studies, you'll see them on our website. They are exceptionally high. Uh, and, and you want to look at something called disparate impact. Disparate impact basically is, do your assessments uh, uh, have different scores uh, based on gender, race, age? You, you don't want that to happen. So look at the, the validity and make sure that any company that has validity or reliability or disparate impact, 
is using an independent outside research firm as opposed to their own internal people. Because uh, I, I mean, there are, there are uh, situations, you hear rumors where a company does their own internal validity, they see the scores and they say, mm, they're not high enough. Let's just kind of push it up a little here and a little there. You cannot do that with an independent third uh, company. Uh, yeah. So that's, we use uh, a company called ITN and uh, they're totally separate from us. And when our validity, if and when it, it, it doesn't score the way we want it, we make changes and then test and test and test. So that's really important. And that's really what you're helping other people to do as well, aren't you, with your platform at Assessments 24-7, is that you're helping people to think through so that their assessment is not just based on the personality or the ideas of the person who came up with it, but it really is properly scientifically verified and, and can be used uh, in, in that way, yeah. Now, Bongi's asked a, asked a really great question, and, and I suppose this comes to the heart of where I wanted to go with the conversation. We do suspect that the world of work is going to change. One of the early changes we can already see with COVID is a lot more virtual working, a lot more remote teams. So it's a little bit more difficult to, to engage because you don't have the physical proximity with your teams. Um, where would assessments fit in here? How would assessments help uh, a, a manager that's dealing with a remote team? Um, in hiring, you can understand it, but would this also be valuable just to get, maybe they, they weren't connecting strongly enough to their team and maybe an assessment would help them. I'm probably answering the question now, but let, let me just throw the question at you. In a changing world of work, uh, what what's the place of assessments? Yeah, so uh, you you brought up something right at the beginning of this interview, and that was uh, when it comes to virtual work environments, which we're going to see a lot more of. I mean, we're doing it now, but as we open up economies, many companies are starting to realize, you know what, we could work just as well remotely with our workers. Uh, and there are certain workers, certain behavioral types that I believe I'm giving you my opinion, but it's based on many, many years of, uh, of observation. There are certain styles that operate a lot more effectively in a virtual environment. For instance, if we take the DISC assessment, D-I-S-C, uh, I find that the Ds, the dominant styles, and the Cs uh, probably work better in a virtual environment. And mainly because they are more task-oriented and less relationship needs. Uh, the I's and the S's, the, the interactive and the, uh, the steady uh, uh, styles, they are more people oriented and relationship oriented. So they need more contact. So being in an office all by themselves is problematic. They may get up a lot more and walk around, talk to other people. Uh, but as a manager, I would want to make sure that those people uh, virtually, whatever tool you're using, uh, we use Zoom, uh, where there's a lot of interaction on Zoom with, with employees, with teams. Uh, every Tuesday, we have uh, an entire team meeting. All 14 employees are on the Zoom meeting, and it's usually an hour meeting. On Thursdays, uh, we have a, a, a one o'clock Pacific marketing meeting. So all of our marketing and salespeople are on that meeting. But within the week, these little groups of people uh, who are either on teams or in various departments, training, IT, sales, marketing, uh, they have their own little meetings, just like you and I are talking right now. So there is a way that we can give the I's and the S's uh, some ability, some face to face, some relationship, whereas the D's and C's Hey, it doesn't matter. I don't need to be on these meetings. In fact, as a D, uh, I know that I get in trouble with my employees because, uh, you know, uh, there was an old film uh, by uh, what was his name? Oh, the uh, the great English com comedic actor, J uh, John Cleese. Is that his name? Uh, John Cleese. Yeah, yeah, yeah. John Cleese. Yeah. He had a he had a, a short little training video called "Meetings, Bloody Meetings." 
I, I know the one you're talking about. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. And, and, you know, that's my whole thing. You know, so I tell my team, why do we have so many meetings, you know, and why are these meetings so long? Do they have to be? But this is a D talking. A C would say the same thing. But the I's and S's love it. Yeah. So it's important as a manager that you know which styles you don't have to worry about. They're they're focused. Uh, you know, I just told my team, you know what? I'm going into semi-retirement, so I'm dropping down from 12 hours a day to eight hours a day. That's my, that's a D's semi-retirement. Just say, good grief. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and S, but, and S would have collapsed a long time ago. <laughs> so, I mean, this is the point, right? Is that in, in any work environment, knowing who you're working with and who you're working for and who's working for you is absolutely vital. The more you know about them, the better you can connect with them and engage with them. Working in a virtual environment where we've taken away one of the points of connection, that geographic point of connection at an office, it becomes even more important to understand the personalities that you're dealing with. And, and so it's not just in hiring people in, but it's also in managing your team that assessments are important. Now, as, as we get towards the, the end of our conversation, Ronald's asked a point I'm sure you've heard a million times before. Don't assessments just put people in a box? Isn't there a danger of, you know, it's D-I-S-C, you're in a box. How, how do we overcome that? Well, remember, it's not necessarily a box. Uh, you are a rainbow of colors. And, and anybody who's familiar with DISC realizes that there are two measures of DISC. There is a natural measure, which is your, your typical style when left alone, what do you like? And then there's your adapted style. And your adapted style is the style that literally can change from day to day from person to person, from environment to environment, because your, your adapted style is the way you change to meet the situation or the individual that you're dealing with. So it's not really putting people in a box. It's, it's knowing, hey, your, your, my preferred style is D. Does that mean I am in my D mode all the time? Absolutely not. One of my, my friends, when he calls me up, uh, and, you know, we have caller ID, so I know it's him. It's, it says Scott. And uh, so I will either answer the phone. Now, listen to this. I will either answer the phone like this. What do you want? What, what, what mode am I in right now, Graham? I'm in my D mode, right? That's your, that's your high D, right? Yeah. High high D. And, and he picks up, and here's what he says. He says, Tony, one thing. Tells me the thing, and that's it. Boom. Yeah, conversation. So, that, yeah, so that, that's that's adaptability. Now, yeah. and every so often he'll call. I, I'll see it's him, and I'll say Tony's Pizzeria. Uh, what kind of toppings? And then he knows to kind of. It's a different engagement a little. Yeah. Uh, so the the whole thing is we're not really putting people in a box. We're trying to understand what motivates, what moves people. And, yeah. and then interacting with them, speaking their language, so to, so to speak. But it's not a linguistic language. It's a behavioral language. Tony, my, one of my very first experiences of the DISC profile in particular was, uh, as I'm thinking about it now, nearly 30 years ago, very early on in my career, I, I was in a, 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 a job where I had quite a lot of responsibility for my age. Um, but it wasn't a very nice environment. And I was working hard. I was trying to prove myself as a young person in the space. And uh, there, there was some toxic stuff going on in the team. And they came in and did a DISC profile. And I forget exactly how it came across. But one of the things the DISC profile can show you is your stress. And I think it's probably the difference between who you really are and, and who yes. you're being forced to be, right, in, yes. in the workplace. And in the moment, I wouldn't have called myself stressed. And I would have simply said, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying the challenge of, of engaging with this um, complex work environment. But what that test, and I remember the, 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 the person who did it with me sat me down and said, you, you're in a load of trouble here. This is not just a small amount of stress. You are being asked to be somebody you're not in this mm -hmm. workspace. And they didn't tell me what to do. 
They didn't tell me I should resign or throw my toys. They just said, this is problematic. And, and for me, that's when I fell in love with assessments because they just put into words what I knew in my heart, that I was in the wrong space. And it wasn't about putting me in a box. It, they weren't telling me I couldn't do the job because I was doing the job. I was doing it. And, and I was being uh, applauded and awarded for doing it. But it would have killed me if I had stayed there um, mm -hmm. because it wasn't me. And so it isn't about putting you in a box. It's about helping you to understand strengths and weaknesses, likes and dislikes. It gives you an invitation to change and improve in certain areas if you want to. Right. Or it says focus in on these areas because this is a sweet spot for you. So I've I've been a fan of assessments and DISC in particular for 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 many many years. So I would highly recommend um, assessments to people if you haven't done one or you haven't done one recently. Maybe this this COVID moment is an opportunity to just find yourself again and find your team uh, if you're a manager. But Tony, maybe let me hand back to you just for any final words for those people who who, who are watching this video in replay or, or with us live. Uh, what would you say to, to people who's struggling through this COVID crisis? Uh, and and, and uh, kind of what do you think they should be focusing on to help get them and their teams through? Well, uh, I, I one of the beauties of assessments, as, as you so uh, articulately stated, in fact, uh, I'm going to offer you a job as a sales rep for me. <laughs> I'll, I'll join your meeting on Thursday, yeah. <laughs> is, is, uh, it really is a great opportunity to see the makeup of your team to determine where there are uh, lapses or gaps in your team. Uh, I remember years ago, uh, I had on my team all high eyes and, and then me and uh, that, that you know nobody was a c to really check the facts or an s to kind of handhold people through things uh i think it's important to understand what the makeup of your group is uh and and to show people to teach people whether it is virtually or in person how to interact more effectively with, with each other. That's what we do on our team. We're in the business of assessments, so we better be good at it internally. Uh, I know one of, your, uh, one of our guests here asked, well, what's the difference between DISC and MBTI? Uh, DISC is a, 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 a simplified version, four styles, MBTI has 16, but the person who asked that question, rather than getting into some detail, if you email me, I will send you, uh, uh, a specific document that shows the differences between the two. There are differences between the two. So, uh, uh, and you, you know, uh, Graham, my email is aja at alessandra.com. I'm putting that into the chat box right now so that people can get it. And thank you. Uh, it'll be great. People can contact you directly. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's, it's important right now in what we're doing not only to look at our present team uh, to see how well it is functioning uh, and make sure that we have all the, the, the uh, no gaps, uh, but also to look at if we are in fact either hiring back people or we are hiring people to make sure that we are hiring top performers, not people who are uh, going to be just mediocre or not great performers. And Graham, one other important thing about assessments, assessments are objective and much of the hiring process is subjective. Resumes, people have described resumes as a balance sheet with no debits because nobody talks about negatives. Uh, the personal interview uh, is very subjective. Uh, both are trying to, you know, it's almost like a first date where you're put, trying to put your best foot forward testimonials or recommendations from previous employers. Previous employees, employers have to be very careful about what they say about a past employee, even one that was not good, because maybe you'll be sued. Uh, uh, I'm not saying to hire, fire, promote, or whatever with an, with an assessment. It's just another piece of information that's objective and incredibly, incredibly valuable. 
Well, Tony, uh, we, we could talk for, for ages and you've got such insight uh, into this. We've already gone well over uh, the, the time that we had allocated the half hour and, and I'm, I'm really gl grateful for your time. Thank you for getting up nice and bright and early for us, uh, California side. Um, for those who do want to pick up the conversation, and I do actually see one or two other questions coming in. Tony's given you his email address, and I know he's very generous uh, with uh, him and his team's uh, time and engaging with you. So if you want to ask any further questions, please be in touch with him. Uh, have a look at assessments 24 X7. So 20, 24 times 7 assessments, 24x7.com. Uh, and you'll see all of the information and a lot of answers uh, at that website. Tony, uh, thanks again for your time. Really appreciate it. For all of those people who are getting out of the crisis and into the opportunity on the other side of COVID, I hope that they consider assessments as one of the tools that they can use in that process. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Graham. I appreciate it.